Well, if I'd known all this, I'd wore my Oakley shirt today. Well, what we have here, my dear son, is a new, something new that you probably never had before, which is vine okra that all the good folks I have heard me talk about. But I think I'm going to rename it and start calling it mountain okra. Mountain. Vine okra, mountain, mountain okra. okra. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was wondering, almost looks like a mini version of Star David. It's got all those kind of ribs on it there. Ridge loafa, as some people call it. And uh, the, the trick to cooking this okra, or any okra for for uh, for a matter of fact, is to cut it up, put some salt on there, and let it sweat a little bit before you put some flour and cornmeal on there. And that sweating process allows to draw some of that moisture out of it to hold that flour and that cornmeal. Yeah, I'll tell you another good thing. If you're gonna fry a bunch of okra, that other Cajun fire unit I got, you can sure enough fry a bunch of that thing. I, I can get myself sick off of it. Now ain't that pretty? Tell the fine folks out there what it tastes like. It tastes a little different than regular okra. It ain't got quite the okra taste to it. It tastes a little bit sweeter to me. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a good okra, mountain okra, that is. Uh, these plants are really prolific. They make a lot. Um, I did pick one here to kind of give everybody an idea of the size you want to harvest it at and then how we cut it up. These it's things almost got more of a kind of on the rear end of it, a little bit of a squash taste. It does. To it. Well, it, it is a cucurbit. It right? is. So, this is about the size you want to uh, harvest them. These things grow quick and they load up. So, what I do is I just cut the ends off of it. Then you just go to cutting on it. Cut them up and just like that. Little bit of spots. I put them in a bowl. That there jumped off the table. Put them on a bowl, and then I salt them good. Let them sweat. Then come back. And I like to use a mixture of flour and cornmeal. Now and can them things get too big? Oh you? yeah, they'll get huge. Well, I mean, where you can't eat them. Oh yeah, yeah. They get they get big and they have seed cavities in there, and they're not uh, they're not near as good. So you want to eat them. Right, that's right that's about the stage you want to. Yep, you want to harvest them out. And like man, you talking about productive, these things will make. Now, I do recommend growing them on a trellis because they're a little bit cleaner if they're up on a trellis. Another thing, too, that I noticed, some of the ones that was laying on the ground, the pickle worm had got to them. Mm. But the pickle worm won't get to them. He can't jump up there and get them on that trellis. So he didn't bother these. So that's the reason it's important to grow them on a trellis. A lot cleaner and keep them there. Now, pickle worm get on my cucumbers on a trellis. Well, he didn't jump up there and get these, but he did gnaw on them on the ground. So... Uh, Are you growing out a bunch of them for seed too? I'm growing some out for seed. Yeah, I am. I'm growing a bunch. I got a pretty good row of them. That's that's. It's not bad right there. I don't believe yeah. you, you told anybody what it was. You just told them it was okra. I don't know that they'd be able to tell the difference. I don't know either. It's it definitely would be something that you need to have in your repertoire. Repertoire. Wep Repertoire. A weapon in your weapon. Yeah. I got a lot to show today. You Man, know. I got okay. a show and tell. I got lots going on. Oh, First of all, we have got some new sound system. We, we work on People it. have been complaining and they had legitimate complaints and y'all ordered a bunch of expensive stuff I seen the other day. I was in my office and I had this email come through with all this expensive order on there and I jumped up and ran to the bus. I said, what's going on? We ordered some new sound stuff. I said, well, my goodness, I didn't have no idea sound stuff cost as much as it does. So unbeknownst to me, they have invested in some good sound quality equipment that will hopefully make a big difference. Hopefully it does. Uh, working with you, filming you uh, with the lab mic is certainly challenging. Yeah. Uh, but I don't. Uh, ever, it's not I, the equipment. It's me. No, I don't really ever have any issues when I'm doing my videos outside. But for some reason, you put that mic on you, and mm. it just starts malfunctioning. Mm. So, hopefully, this is a little better this week. If not, we we I just let everybody know we are working and striving towards uh, trying to make it better. So I've been working on this microgreen deal, and I'm I'm, I'm really stoked about it. I Those think look I, nice. I right got there. it about figured out. And while I got four different ones here today, Let's scoot them I over want you to try and tell me your thoughts on this first one. Right, let's start it on this end. This is our premium greens mix. Uh mm huh. -hmm. So try you a little bit of that, and I'm gonna do the same. You just put it there. You don't hurt us all. Eat off the table. This is the one that we sell that you can grow out in the garden. Grows pretty good, pretty quick. We grown mm -hmm. it out in the leaf stage in 21 days. Mm -hmm. Now this one has a little more bite to it. 
But you got that red mustard in there. Yep. You got that arugula in there. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not too bad. <coughs> you taste the mustard right off. Excuse me. <coughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Mustard got me quick. Um, that's the one I like to. Um, I like a salad with. I don't mind a little bit of the spice, but uh, right. I also like to saute those really good. Next one there is lacinato kale. That's what I feel. You know, I think these probably grown up, grew off as pretty as anything. Did. Nice dark green Man. color on them. Standard is not near as spicy tastes as that. Like kale. It tastes like kale. Mm -hmm. Make a great salad on its own. You don't need a whole lot to it. Now, if you want to spice it up a little bit, you can throw you a little bit, of, mix those two together, and you can kick it up a little bit. This is going to blend it down a little bit. Dark green, so you know it's good and healthy for you. That would make a great salad on a sandwich right by itself. Now, I have been to a restaurant before, and they use these things almost like a lettuce replacement on a sandwich. Sure. And uh, it's pretty good that, that way. Now, here's something that's going to be a little unusual. Detroit dark red beet. Detroit. Detroit. Now, some of the seed coatings have just started coming off from this. Let me give it, one, give it a little crunch. Let me get a little crunch on that. They didn't grow off quite as quick. But, you know, they have the nice red stems on them there. Mm-hmm. Tastes, tastes uh, beady. It does taste beady, and that's got more flavor to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can taste a little bit of that earthy beet flavor. It tastes just like a beet, doesn't it? It's amazing. Yeah, yeah, it sure does. Uh, I believe you could, a fellow that was accustomed to eating a lot of vegetables, I believe he could almost, he was blindfolded, halfway guess at what some of these oh, are. Oh, yeah. You won't ever guess what this one is if you didn't know. That, this one? Yeah. Oh, let me guess here. That, I think, is our... I'm going to guess that's our Ruby Fresh Baby Swiss Chard. I think you're probably right. Swiss you Chard. I think I knew that, dude. Yep. Swiss Chard. Look at the roots coming you out. You know how I know? Because on that Ruby Fresh, the um, the stems on it got that pink color there. Mm. That's kind of what give it away. But it looks like beets because they're in the same family as the beets. Look at there. Man, just this little bit of greens in this little tray here provides a whole lot of nutritional value get there. get them seed caps out of there. I like to kind of spread out and look at what I'm fixing to eat. Now those taste more like Swiss chard. Mm-hmm. A little darker flavor to it. Yeah, yeah. A, little, a little, little bit flavor. of bitter there, yep. kind of like you do see on Swiss chard. Yep. Um, but very, very flavorful. They are. I don't know that that would be in my top three. That's probably be of my least choice there. Okay, of the ones that we've gotten right here, let's kind of categorize them as to flavor how we would like them. Lacinato kale comes out on top with me, with the uh, the beets on second, and the third is premium greens mix. Uh, yeah, I, I like. I'd say these two are probably my. Uh, Top. Yep. I think I like the green sweets more. It's just got more overall flavor because there's so many different varieties there. Yep. There you have it, folks. And we got a lot of great things coming with these. So you about got the microgreen thing figured oh, yeah, out. Yeah, but we're working on some special things coming up. Special things. It's too early to announce. Yeah. But we got some great things coming with microgreens. Uh huh. You know, the great thing is you can grow your greens year around mm -hmm. if they have the right setup. We're going to have some awesome kits where you can grow them in your house. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're getting ahead of yourself a little bit there now, ain't you? Yeah. All right, one more thing. Because even if you got a greenhouse, you've been growing these right in the office. Right in the office. Yeah, I've been growing these in the greenhouse. I have not. So anybody can grow those. Now, mm -hmm. some of you may that's not well versed with microgreens may not understand how you eat them. We've talked about salads. We're talking about eating them as garnishes with different, say, pasta or things. You could also eat them on sandwiches. But here's a nice little salad made with just microgreens. Of course, we had some cucumbers, we had some tomatoes in there. See what all's in there? A little, some cheese in there. And that makes a great little salad right by itself. You can put some balsamic vinegar on there. Man, you talking about healthy. That does look good there. Uh-huh. Did you, you already put some dressing on it and everything? We're gonna see, it was actually hint, Miss Hoss fixed this for me and I'm gonna see how she it was doctored it up. That's right. Where'd you get them cherry tomatoes from? 
Those, I don't know. I don't know where she got them They're from. They're making them ones. No, they're not. We didn't ever. We did. We talked about that on the Instagram video, but uh, I don't think we ever mentioned that on the show. There is a variety of determinate grape tomatoes that we uh, had the pleasure of uh, taste testing. They sent us some from a grow out that the grower was doing. They're disease resistant. They're determinate and great, which is unique. Most of those grape cherry tomatoes are indeterminate. So this is a determinate, and uh, I'm, I am not kidding y'all. It was one of the best tastes. It was by far the best one I've ever tasted. It was uh, just bloody. It had a real dark, almost purple color to it. And uh, I'm working on getting us some seeds on those. I'm excited seed. about the ter determinate part of it because right. I've never grown a determinate cherry tomato before. Yeah, and with mine, it, the problem is that you, at some point later in the season, when it gets you know June, July, them things are just crawling everywhere, and they're kind of hard to, to deal with, and uh, unless you make a real tall trellis, so uh, I'm I got some things in the works with them coming along. Good deal. Other thing, we talked about this on a few shows ago. We are uh, slowly implementing, we got our new bags in. And uh, man, I'm, that's pretty, ain't it? It is pretty. Good. Our new foil bags. And uh, we still have some stuff packed in the older brown bags. So there's no 100% guarantee that if you order a bulk seed that you'll get one of these. But uh, as we're packing more seeds every day, we're... Uh, we're not packing anything else in the old, the um, craft, the brown bags, everything's getting packed in these and we've got a lot of different sizes. Nice foil bag there, uh, sealed off so you cut the seal then it's got a zipper on it. And um, we have one bag bigger than this, we'll be starting to do some 20 pound stuff pretty soon. But uh, that right there look nice when it arrives at your doorstep. And people that are not familiar with these foil bags, and we get a lot of people concerned about storing their seed these four bags are the cat's meow for seed storage here because they seal up. They don't let moisture in or out. So if you're going to store, have to store your seed for a while, this is the type bag you want to store them in. Costs us a little bit more, more, more money, more money, but we're going to offer these bags for our seeds so that you won't be concerned about storing your seeds and it'll be the best out there. Right, so if you don't use this whole five pound of Austrian winter Zip pea back up. this October, you zip it up, put it in the refrigerator, and uh, it'll stay good for you. Actually, you can put it anywhere in your house that stays a constant temperature. So if your house stays a constant, say 78 degrees, you don't even need to put it in the refrigerator. Yeah, you just don't want to shock it. You don't right. want to let it sit in the truck for a week uh, hot or whatever. But anyway, got those in, and uh, you'll start seeing those in your mailbox as you order bulk seeds, cover crops, stuff like that. A little update on the elephant garlic. We thought it was going to be here this week. Had a little hiccup uh, with the truck. You gonna give an update on that? Well, these freight trucks always have hiccups. They lost our elephant garlic. It went to the wrong terminal. So I checked on it this morning. It was in Illinois. So hopefully by Monday we'll have it. So yeah, next week we should have it. We got everything ready to go as far as we can pack it, have it on the side as soon as it gets here. As soon as we know it's backed up to our loading dock. I got uh, I got fall pole beans coming up about this tall, mm. about three, four inches tall. Uh, I got my sweet corn, finally got my fall sweet corn planted, went with the primus. You got a little right. late on that, didn't you? A little late, a little late. We're going to be cutting it close. Old Jim Horn planted him some the other day a little late. I said, Jim, I think you're going to be all right, but you need to get it in the ground. Does he plant a triple sweet or old school I don't school know what he planted. He told me, or he might have told me, I don't know, but Jim's... First year gardener, and I'm telling you, he's being pumped up and done a great job this yeah. year. He get, he gets pumped up about it, don't he? He get, he just gets excited. Bless yeah. his heart. Yeah. Yeah. If you go if you gonna be kind of cutting it close, uh, I always recommend going with a triple sweet or quad sweet, something closer to 75 days. Uh, it's gonna be hard, or you gonna. You're going to be sweating bullets a little bit if you plant something like a silver queen that's going to take you a, a little longer. So I got mine in. Like them triple sweets, they always come up two to three days. Once Sally gets out of here, it'll start growing good. Sally? Who is Sally? Sally is what has made it dark around here for about yeah. the last two or three days. Um, Sally initially was not supposed to bother us a whole lot and still hasn't really bothered us a whole lot, but Sally got close to the shoreline and just just slowed stopped. down, stopped, 
and then decided to make a hard right turn. Them folks in Alabama have took a beating off of it though. Yeah, Mobile and uh, Pensacola, Gulf Shores around there. It looks like that's where it kind of ended up uh, making landfall. And um, we, we've we been getting a lot of, not a lot of hard rain, but just a lot of slow drizzling, soaking in rain, mm -hmm. which we could, we, we it was dry here. Yeah. We could, I could use a little bit at my house. Uh, now, them people getting 10 to 15 inches and flooding, uh, you know, prayers go out to them. That's yeah. no fun. No, it's not. But we're going to, it still, uh, I think through Thursday, we'll be dealing with Sally. And I looked at the weather forecast, I, I don't see nothing over like 83 for the next two weeks. I, I, I think my fall prediction is. Uh, Come, my early fall prediction is coming true. We've got a cool snap coming in. I'm sure looking forward to it. Me too. Me too. Got me itching to go to the mountains again. Bad. Bad. I, I, this weekend, I had a hard time staying at the house. I was wanting to go to the mm -hmm. mountains. Mm -hmm. Stick and put in that cold stream. Go up there. I hope the leaves start changing colors up there pretty soon. Yeah. All that good stuff. <coughs> oh, excuse me. What else? Oh, we got some... Uh, should be here any day now. We got some new cold season cover crops we're adding, I think four or five of them. And um, chickpea, some forage collards, African cabbage, uh, a white Dutch clover, a Berseum clover. Uh, I think that's five of them there. We'll be adding those. We'll probably do a show, if not next week, probably the next pretty soon on cool season cover crops because it's getting that time to be thinking about them and uh, getting those in the ground. I'm going to plant quite a few cool season cover crops this year. Yeah, I'm excited about these clover crops. I love clover. I'm going to tell you, folks, this white ditch we're getting in is the most heat tolerant cover crop, I mean clover cover crop I have ever seen. It would just about grow all year round here in the south. Yeah, and some of these these African impact cabbage and these impact forage collards are really, really good for those people who have clay or compacted soils. These things get in there and their roots just kind of tickle that soil, get it all well conditioned. And if you got livestock, you can graze it and you get boom, boom, double the effect because you get the manure in there too. So let's talk about some of these new regular vegetable crops that we're going to be getting in. New regular, yeah, I got I got three I want to show you that I uh, just got on the site this week that I'm excited about. <clears throat> First one is a cauliflower here called Minute Man Cauliflower, and this is a very early maturing variety of cauliflower. Uh, it comes off. Depending on your heat, it could come off anywhere from 50 to 70 days from transplant. Um, so a really nice uniform variety, good hybrid. They call it Minute Man because it's probably the earliest maturing variety out there. 97% germination. 97% germination, that's what it says. Man, as always, providing you a good seed there. Good seed. Then we got uh, this lettuce here. That, that lettuce is 99%. Mm -hmm. A new variety of lettuce called Brave Heart Romaine, and this makes a really, uh, if you like growing romaine to make those big wedge salads, you want real big, huge hearts. You're not doing it as, as like leaf lettuce, but you want those big romaine hearts. This is your go-to variety. Uh, so we just added that on the site. Uh, excited about those. And this last one here, now you, you don't have to be, you don't have to have clay or muck soils for this to be a good carrot for you. But I'll tell you, this Envy carrot right here is known to still produce nice, big, long carrots, even in clay or what they call muck soils. I'm going to be growing some of these. Um, oh, um, Mr. Rayberg come by and got some um, earlier this week. He's going to be growing some. So this is a really good variety. It gets about 10 to 12 inches long. Nice carrot, but like I said, it's it has a really good root structure and it's supposed to perform well even in harder soils. Let me see that. I hadn't seen those. Yep, nice orange carrot. Mm-hmm. Nice little bright orange, fresh eating carrot. Okay. Today, but wait, one more thing. So, um, we were supposed to, if you've been watching the show a while, you might remember us mentioning this back in the spring. We were supposed to speak at the Homesteaders of America conference in uh, 
I can't remember the town in Virginia that was supposed to be at. But in Virginia this October, well, due to the COVID, that thing kind of got canceled and it's all digital or all virtual now. And uh, we're still doing a presentation there due to us being out in the country and things don't always work as well doing it live. So we, uh, we pre-recorded our part. We've already shot that and got it edited and sent over to the folks at the HOA. So uh, if you have it registered for the HOA, there's going to be a lot of good digital content there. Uh, you can watch it in the comfort of your own home in your chair or your couch or wherever you like to uh, watch videos. Be sure to go over to the HOA's website, sign up for that so you can see that video. Homesteaders of America. Yeah, and uh, our presentation or our talk is talking about what we think the most valuable crops are that a homesteader can grow. So y'all go check that out, sign up for that. And I think it's two days worth of videos or presentations that they have going on there. Today, we're gonna to be talking about onions. Yep. And uh, we try to do these uh, shows, the topics from the shows uh, to be time relevant. Onions is kind of tricky because depending on where you live, you plant onions at a completely different time. But since this is getting closer, it's around the time when we need to plant onions, we're going to go ahead and do the onion show. And you people that are middle of the country up north, y'all can just bookmark this and come back around mm -hmm. to it when that time comes. File it back here. <clears throat> so if you don't bring that up right there. So this is what we planted on last week's show. Oh. And they're, uh, looks like they about all have came up. Yep. Close to it. And when onions germinate, they do this funny thing. It, uh, it's kind of folded over, and then the, it kind of flips out there. Yeah, there's one right here. I know you can't see it. There's a little seed coat still on it. Yeah, the chunk got off there in about four or five hours. Yeah. So onions can be a little slower to germinate than, than other things. What you're looking at here is seven-day-old onions. Yeah. Now, we had a lot of people ask uh, when you did your video about uh I remember if you were starting them in raised, starting onion seeds in a raised bed. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are asking, why do you need to start them somewhere and then move them? And one of the reasons is, is per, you know, perfect examples right here. You know, it takes these guys a little ways to get going. If you're just planting them in the ground, it's going you're gonna have a time unless you put down some treff land or something you know, pre-emergent, you're going to have a time with the weeds outpacing the growth on these things initially. Mm -hmm. Now, these things will grow pretty fast once they get up and going, but initially, you're going to have tr trouble with your weeds outpacing them. So that's why we plant them thick and then pull them up and transplant them. Another reason we do it is because onions, is important to have them spaced apart at a certain spacing. If you have them too thick, then you're going to make little bitty onions. And we all want to make those big onions. And to do that, you're going to need to plant them six to eight inches apart. And these seeds are so small, it's nearly impossible to direct seed them and get your spacing out like it should. So that's another reason we put them in transplants, whether in trays or raised beds, and pull them from that and transplant because you can control your spacing up to just like you want. Yeah, even the big farmers, that's how they do it. Uh, just Somebody works. asked me the other day, called and asked me the other day, <coughs> why, we, why do we... Didn't we direct see things like this in cabbage? And I said, because that's just the way we've always done it. Yeah. And it was good for him to jog my memory and me have to think about it and tell him why we, because, you know, sometimes we just have always done it that way. But I did tell him after we got into conversation the reasons why we do it. And it's, they is, these are actually, we have a uh, reason for doing the things we do. Yeah, and even though cabbage seed and onion seed germinates pretty well, I mean, you see here we got pretty good germination. Uh, if you're walking along putting a seed, uh, onion seed, every six inches in your garden, it, it, the chances of you getting that right, as, t as tiny as these seeds are, is going to be tough. It's going to be. And yeah, think about cabbage just the same way. You got to have cabbage pre a, a set far enough about apart. a foot apart. Yeah. yeah, especially if you grow the cabbages like I do, you yeah. need them far apart, and. Um, it, it just gives you, when you transplant things like this, it makes your end result a lot more consistent and better size because you can, you can dictate your spacing better. I agree. So that's why we do it. So let's get in and talk about onions. We started these last week. This is our plethora onion, one of the new varieties we got. And, and 
Let me just let me just go over this because I'm itching to tell people about it. I got a lot of new onion varieties I'm adding. I'm talking about adding new ones about every day uh, since last week's show. Last week I think I showed you the plethora and the carta blanca, which we just added two new short day varieties. Um, plethora is what we got planted here. We've since added one called cougar. So the plethora is a granix type onion. Uh, we've added a round sweet onion, the cougar here. Is that a short day? Yep. Okay. Yep, so this is a short day. We've also just added this here 1015 Y Texas Super Sweet, which is a well, probably one of the most popular varieties out there. Um, it, it's, uh, you know, it's a little different. This is kind of an old school variety versus some of these newer hybrids. Uh, the 1015 Y, you know why they call it 1015? Yep, I do. Because you're supposed to plant them on October 15. So, like I said, if you're in a short day, you still got plenty of time to get your onions to get you planted. I'll have more Texas Legends coming early October. I'll have more short day varieties I'm adding. We've just been adding some intermediate and long day varieties too. I just added this white uh, intermediate day variety called Sierra Blanca. Got more uh, intermediate day varieties we're adding for those of you in the middle of the country. We just added this red long day variety called Red Nugent, and like Ted Nugent, Red mm -hmm. Nugent, you can get it. And uh, that's 96% germ on that one. So got some long day varieties coming. So those of you in the intermediate, long day, and even short day, just kind of keep an eye on the website. We're gonna be adding new varieties. Boom, boom, boom. We're gonna have a huge, I'm really proud of what our onion selection is gonna be like come the next month once we get all these in. I think we're gonna be kind of top of the pack as far as seed suppliers go, as far as the quality of onion varieties we have. Onions are something I think everybody should grow because you can grow them the time of year where they're not competing for, with a lot of other crops for your time and your attention. And they add a lot to your homestead to be able to store them and have them to eat throughout the year. But onions are one of those things that are not necessarily kind to a beginner gardener. You need to do a little bit of research on onions before you start. So many times I see orders fly through where somebody from Florida, Louisiana is ordering a Walla Walla onion. Yeah, or a yellow cipollini onion. Or, yeah, and you don't need to be doing or that. Or you see somebody in Michigan ordering a Texas Legend onion. There are certain times of the year that you need <clears throat> to plant and also there are certain varieties you need to plant where you live and that's where we talk about short day intermediate day and long day. Yeah, and if there's just a variety that you really want to grow but it's not in your, you know, your planting zone, it's just one of them things you're just gonna to have to be perpetually jealous about. I can't ever grow a Walla Walla onion nope. down here. We sell the seed, but it's just not something that you grow in the south. So, we have a chart on our site. Uh, it's on every one of our onion pages and we'll be putting it uh, uh, on the onion category page pretty soon on the new site. This shows you basically based on where you live, what type of onions you need to plant, whether it be short day, intermediate day, or long day. And this is not something that you can really skirt around a whole lot. Now I will say, if you're on the line between intermediate and long day, you can plant kind of either one. If you're on the line between short and intermediate day, you can kind of plant either one. If you're down here like us, nothing but short day. We've been growing onions a long time and have been successful at it. And we got a program. If you'll pay attention to the way we tell you the system we use for growing onions, I guarantee you'll be successful. There's certain tricks to the trade of growing onions. Mm -hmm. And fertilization is one of them. Fertilization is one of them. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Man, I got a piece of that. All hung up. Man, I'm sorry about that, everybody. But I couldn't. <laughs> Had to come out. I couldn't talk. Might have been some of that Swiss chard hung up. Might have been. So we we're talking about the short day, intermediate day, and long day. And let's explain real quick what that means. So onions have two growth phases. They have the vegetative phase and they have the bulbing phase. And the sooner you can understand that, uh, the more successful you're gonna be when you're growing onions. So, the first phase when you trans when these guys are ready to pull out of these cells and I transplant them in the gray in the in the ground, we're gonna start that vegetative phase. Why are you saying that? Let me I'm gonna touch on this just for one minute. Sure. We're talking about eight to ten weeks from we planted these last week. 
So we're, you're normally talking eight to ten weeks from when these are ready to transplant. I'd say uh, I got some come off a little sooner than that last year. Yeah, but, but you can normally. Uh, Jason told me the other day our our onion, one of our seed reps, that the Vidalia guys pretty much figure on ten weeks. Yeah, that's probably right. They're, they're doing it in the ground. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can figure eight to ten weeks. I think it's a pretty good. Anyway, that's probably right. Anyway, so we have the vegetative phase and then we have the bulbing phase the vegetative phase is the first phase that's when you're just growing all that top and if you watch your onions during that phase all they're doing is growing vegetation green vegetation the the base of that onion that bulb is not enlarging when your day length hits a certain number of hours <clears throat> it's going to trigger that bulbing process and people want to ask uh, us all the time how do you know when the bulbing start you can see it you just look around in money plants you'll start to see that soil cracking around there and you know it's bulbing time and when we talk about fertilizer you know obviously that's when we want to cut it off but I normally happen I think last year happened to us around the end of February first March sometime in February it was it can vary a, a, a little bit but um, it is triggered by day length now as far as day length goes, in the winter time, down here in the south, we have longer days than they have up north in the winter. In the summer, up north, they have longer days than we have down here in the south. Anyway, so short day onions start to bulb. The bulbing is triggered when day length gets to be about 10 to 12 hours. So you think about in the winter time, uh, late winter, around that time, the day length starts increasing again when it hits that 10 to 12 hour mark. That's when your bulbing is going to start. Intermediate day, it's going to happen at 12 to 14 hour days. Long day, 14 to 16 hour days. That's why <coughs> you can't plant a long day onion in the south because we don't ever get to 14 to 16 hour day lengths a lot of times. You know, or, or, or yeah, ever way down here and so what happened is you'll just grow vegetation on top of vegetation on top of vegetation never to get no and the, the bulbing will never trigger because that variety is looking for a longer day length on the other hand if you plant a short day onion way up north what's going to happen is as soon as you put it in the ground you may get a little bit of vegetative growth but it's it's looking for t only 10 to 12 hours so it's going to start bulbing pretty quick and there's not going to be a whole lot of vegetation there to produce a big bulb, and you can get a small onion. Yep, and then your neighbors are going to make fun of you because you can't grow onions. <laughs> so grow the right type of onion for where you are. Uh, as far as planting onions go, when to plant, we always, you know, you can see we've already started ours. We look for an in-ground date really any time in November. You could go in early December. Anytime November, early December for us. Onions are cold tolerant down to 20 degrees. So as long as you don't get, you know, 20 or a little bit below, I've seen them survive 17 degrees down here. Uh, as long as you don't get too much colder than that for a long period of time, you can start them in the fall and overwinter them. As far November, as, first November is not my ideal time for planting my onions. As far as short day onions go, if you can plant them in the fall like we do, you will get much bigger onions than if you plant them early in the spring. Um, if you're intermediate day, if you're in the area where you need to grow intermediate day onions, you're going to be looking at late winter, early spring. So, mm -hmm. so you might still be having some frost, but they're not real harsh frost. So you can plant them in late winter or they're early spring. Same thing, long day. You're probably looking at early spring if you own up in those areas. You know, I see some market farmers uh, on Facebook. Some of them ain't been long harvested their onions. It's amazing, and I yeah. see that too, and I think, man, we, <laughs> our onions went bad. Don't, we didn't eat up all our onions. Well, here just, we are getting ready to plant yeah. more, and they just just now harvesting those. So that's crazy. Uh, what else? So shapes of onions. We talked about that before. You'll hear us say granix onion, and um, that's that refers to a more flattened onion. What people are more familiar with as a Vidalia onion. Um, when I used to go <coughs> to the store, you always picked you out a flat onion because your mind told you if you got a flat onion, it was going to be a sweet onion. Yeah. Nowadays, it uh, matter. The, the trend uh, has gone away from the real flat disc shaped onions to a more, a more round onion. I like a round onion better. I think it's easier to slice and kind of 
cook with, but uh, each to their own. The shape of the onion nowadays doesn't necessarily dictate how sweet it is, whereas what you said back in the day, that used to be the prevailing kind mm -hmm. of mindset. Sizes of onions. So you, well, you'll see this on our website. Uh, usually you'll see medium and then large, and you jumbo, and then colossal. Colossal would be them great old big ones. Yeah, so the cougar here is a, a colossal. Uh, I got to plant me some of them pretty The soon. jumbo's the size I like <clears throat> in general. I like, the, I like the, the big ones, but not the colossal. Was so. it last year, year before last, some folks from Florida brought by that? Ooh, it was year before last. That was the biggest onion I believe I ever seen. It was huge. It was huge. I've never grown one that big. Um, we talked about the investment phase versus the payoff phase, also the vegetative phase versus the bulbing phase. So when you're growing onions, this is this is what you got to remember. You got to maximize the vegetation in this vegetative or investment phase and with onions you do that by giving them plenty of water and you got to give them plenty of fertilizer now when we first put them in the ground when we first transplant them we usually give them a little bit of complete fertilizer give them a little phosphorus and potassium right at the beginning and then we'll switch to just nitrogen and they love sulfur they do love sulfur. I have used Chilean nitrate in the past. It works good. The ammonium sulfate is probably a little more appropriate as far as Absolutely. allium fertilizer. The sulfur gives them that good onion flavor. Um, so you can inject the ammonium sulfate. You can also side dress with it. Um, so I plant my onions on, uh, I plant mine on drip tape. You don't. Right. Uh, I put mine on double rows on drip tape. And I will say if you're doing that, um, it, that technique works if you don't have real heavy weed pressure. If you got real heavy weed pressure, I wouldn't recommend doing the double rows on drip tape. Or if you're more advanced <coughs> gardener with plenty of wisdom like what I have, you can get by with doing just a single rose. If you're a, a younger gardener, you may need to do the double rows like what you do. <laughs> I don't really understand uh, why that would matter. But I just uh, thought I'd throw that in there. Okay. You, you thrown a jab or two, I thought I'd throw a jab Okay, back. okay. Um, so w whether you got the drip tape, your side dress them however you want to, you want to feed them some complete fertilizer initially. You could also use that uh, complete organic pelleted hem manure we got. You just want to be a little bit ahead as far as getting that in the soil because it's not quite as quick. Right. I normally put it in a week to 10 days ahead of time, incorporate it into the soil, let that uh, biostimulants in your store start to work and break that down and it'll be ready for when those onions hit there and get, get them off to a good start. And I can't remember the specific rate on the ammonium sulfate. It's on the bag. Um, it's on the website. <coughs> Excuse me. As far as how much we use. A lot of people make the mistake of not fertilizing the onions enough. Onions take a lot of fertilizer. Yeah, you want them tops to be nice, big, and heavy when that day length starts getting longer and that bulbing starts. And when that bulbing starts, because uh, we might have learned this lesson the hard way at a time or two, when that bulbing starts, you don't want to fertilize them anymore. Cut them off. What's going to happen if you continue to fertilize them is you're going to cause yourself some problems such as blight. Blight is uh, pretty bad about <clears throat> getting into onions. And one of the reasons they get into onions is because too much fertilizer is thrown to them in the bulbing process and it stresses that plant out and that blight is jumping there. Now, if you get a little bit of blight, don't worry about it. Most of the time you can fight that off and outgrow it. But uh, be careful with that uh, fertilizing after you start bulbing. Yeah. Yeah, so cut it off. Don't give me more. You, you got your time to fertilize is all during that uh, vegetative phase there. One other thing, uh, a lot of people have said, I haven't ever had much success growing onions, and then I'll start talking to them. And the problem is what they did is they went to either Big Blue or the Big Orange store and bought these little onion sets and planted them. And you're just not going to get very big onions from planting those things. Well, you don't know what what variety you got. Is it the right onion for your right zone? Who knows? The takeaway on onions is plant the right variety at the right time and fertilize them the correct way, and you're going to be successful. That's right. That's right. Now you can you as far as the spacing goes, you can play with that a little bit. Uh, I've grown as close as four inches, sometimes eight inches apart. Uh, 
Uh, I personally like to plant mine all four inches apart and then come in there and pull air other one. As a green onion. As a green and, onion. And, and ate it. And yep. eat on that with a little fish and, mm -hmm. or, or whatever. But you can, uh, you, can, you can play with the spacing a little bit. The goal is to get some baseball to softball size big old onions. Right. If you do all these things right, you should be pretty successful. And that way you'll that. be the envy of the neighborhood. That's right. That's right. Bragging rights. Yeah. Got bigger onions yeah. than everybody. Let me show you what I did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Now, onion, onions is one of those things where you can, you know, we, we've talked about other things like taters and stuff. People get in a hurry on it, mess them up. Onions, now if you're on the ball or on the giddy up with these, this is going to pay off for you. And you're going to have the, the bigger onions before anybody else does. Yep. All right. If you have any more questions about planting onions, uh, let us know in the comments below. We'll be glad to try to answer them for you. Lots of good stuff there. And like I said, stay you know, tuned to the website. If you're not on email newsletter list, join that. And you can uh, know when these new varieties are available. Got some questions from last week's show. Uh, most of these are about seed starting, some about onions. And uh, if we do answer your question on the show, send us an email to cussserve at hosttools.com and we'll send you a nice little prize. We'll tell you what prize we're going to send this week. So I have some of this seed here stuck back in the seed room hid. Uh -huh. So if, if we answer your question, send us your, your email with your address. And I'm going to send you some of these seeds. Now, it may be a little bit too late to plant them this year, but you can put them in your refrigerator and save them until springtime and you can plant them. So you're going to get a good little helping of ridge loofah or mountain okra. How about that? Yeah, we, we even put them in one of our smaller, nice mm -hmm. little full bags so they'll store well for right. that person on into the spring. First question comes from Tim N. And he wants to know, can I use my 162 cell tray for my onion transplants? I haven't been able to purchase your 338s yet. You certainly can. And I grew them in the 162s before we started carrying the 338s. Uh, you just get more onion. Onion transplants, they, they don't take a lot of room. They don't take a lot of soil. Uh, so you can, you, you can get more per square foot with a 338. But no, you can certainly grow them in the 162s. And you can even, with the 162s, drop two or three seeds per cell if you want to. And they're easy to, the plants are easy to tease and pull apart when you're out there in the field planting them. So, yeah, you could certainly do it that way um, as opposed to, to this way here. Yep. These are deep trays right here, and they're ideal for onions. But by all means, you do it in 162. Number two is from Perry Hubbard, <laughs> and uh, he says... Um, some additional information that would be helpful for starting my own seeds would be the approximate time for the seeds to germinate and the length of range of time necessary from planting the seeds to transplanting them in the garden. Can you work us up something like that? So mm. he's got a small garden and he plants a lot of different things in one particular seed tray. Uh, so that information would be helpful to him. Yeah, maybe something we should work on. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'll give you an idea of what I do. I mean, probably tomorrow I'm going to plant some kale and some collards. And I don't need a whole, I use a 162, but I don't need a whole tray to either one. So I'll bust it up and I'll plant half the tray in Las Nato Kale and I'll plant the other half in Top Bunch Collards. And those basically come off about the same time. You can figure eight to ten weeks on those. Now some things I will not mix up in the tray with kale or collards and one of them would be lettuce because lettuce comes off a little bit quicker. I'd want to grow lettuce by itself in another tray. For the most part, you can mix and match, but there are a few things that's going to grow off a lot quicker that you wouldn't want to uh, to mix in with some of the ones that take a little bit longer. And lettuce would be one of them. I can think of some of the summer crops, and we don't do a whole lot of transplanting with, with cucumbers or squash, but if you were going to do that, you definitely wouldn't want, wouldn't want to mix them in a tray with tomatoes. Yeah. So you could kind of keep it up. <coughs> or peppers. Or peppers, because they take a, lot, a long time. But lettuces I would keep together in one tray, and all your other cold crops that we're planting now, collards, kohlrabi, cabbage, you know. All those brassicas could be mixed. Yeah, you can mix those together because they're going to come off about the same time. Normally eight to ten weeks. Yeah, and, and as far as the first part of this question goes, <laughs> uh, uh, the germination time. For most of your things, your lettuce, your brassicas, any of that, those things should germinate in three to five days. 
if, if, if you're looking at 10 days and they say hadn't germinated something wasn't right and they probably not going to germinate either you, you, scrap it and start over uh, now these onions do take a little longer but for the most part most things are going to germinate in, in ideal seed starting conditions I'd say in three to five days yeah all right next question comes from Mike Huffman when starting onion when starting onions indoors how long do you run the lights we're running lights 14 to 16 hours trigger short day onions to bulb well I, I say when you're doing it indoors and you're doing it in grow lights uh, what you want to do is you want to simulate your outdoor light cycle so you know here right now uh, it's getting light about seven o'clock and it's getting dark about eight o'clock so we're looking at 11 hours of daylight so i would try to simulate that inside if that's uh, if I was growing inside, I wouldn't leave them on for 20 hours. Uh, it's going to throw them plants for a little bit of a loop, probably, uh, and it could, yeah, could could make them want to start. Now they, they, when they're in this stage, they're not going to start bulbing uh, anyway. But uh, yeah, just simulate what you got going on outside, and I think that's probably your safest bet. So I'm, as you well know, I'm doing some work with grow lights now, and I'm going to throw this little thing out there that I never thought about before, before I started working with them. This is what I've been doing. <clears throat> exactly what you said, I've been simulating outside, but I only have one grow light, uh -huh. but I've got two trays. Uh -huh. So I will leave the light on 24-7, uh -huh. and I will, about 8 o'clock at night, I will take the one that's been in there all day out and put the other one in the grow light thing, and then the next morning I swap them out back again. That way I leave my, I utilize my grow lights, run 24-7, and I've got two trays that I alternate back and forth. It's good. Now, isn't that small? Yeah, and they both get approximately 12, 12 yeah. hours of, uh, of light. Yeah. That's, that's a good idea. If, if, yeah, things are relatively equal like that, that works pretty good. Yep. All right. Last one here is from Southern Hillbilly, and he says, uh, did y'all mention hardening off the plants? That's where he has struggled. Yeah, and I do this a lot because it's important. <clears throat> when my plants get close to the point of uh, when you can pull them up and the roots, you know, the, come, the root plug comes out good and you got a good root system on there, I move them outside of the greenhouse and I put them out there on a little pallet that I keep out there. I cut the fertilizer off and I don't water them as often and I let them get drier out and that hardens that plant off and makes that plant tougher so that when I transplant it in the garden, I got a better success rate out there. If you put a tender growing plant out there, it's going to struggle. So you want to harden those plants off a little bit before you transplant them out in the garden. They stand a better chance of making it. I do that with the water, bringing the water off of them, letting it get drier, and absolutely cutting the fertilizer off. Yeah, and you want to sit them on something like a pallet so it can drain. drain and yeah. also, be careful, if these things are close to being ready, they'll start rooting. The roots underneath here will start kind of anchoring to the ground. I've seen them anchored to a slab of concrete before. Yeah. Uh, so you want them on something kind of elevated. And normally, I'll, I'll hold them off <coughs> two or three, four or five days, not for a very long time. Right, right. This time of year, we don't have to harden things as much as we do in the spring Springtime. when we're talking about getting peppers and tomatoes yep. uh, from that warm greenhouse out into a more cooler environment. Uh, these things, uh, you don't have to harden them off as much. Correct. All right. That's going to do it for us tonight. <clears throat> Good little show about onions. Yep. Hopefully we got a cool season cover crop show coming up pretty soon. If you guys out there have any other ideas for uh, upcoming shows, always put those in the comments and we'll try to uh, theme a show around it. Sure. Hope everybody enjoyed the show tonight. If you did, make sure to give us a big thumbs up. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Hit that bell button so you get notified every time we have a new video. And if you did enjoy this onion video, check out these other two onion videos right here. I think you'll really enjoy those as well. We'll see you next time. Take care.